Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the University Town Hall at Wichita State University. My name is Whitney Bailey, and I am Faculty Senate President. Hi, everyone. My name is Gabriel Fonseca, and I serve as the Staff Senate President. Thank you for taking time to join us this afternoon. Um, we're going to give um, President Muma and Interim Provost Lefevre a chance to um, introduce themselves and provide an update. But before we do that, if um, the viewers today have any questions or comments that you want to put in the chat, please feel free to do that. Gabriel and I will be monitoring the chat, so we'll get those questions asked um, as we see those. If we don't get a, an answer to your question today, um, be sure that Gabriel and I will work to get um, questions to the comments that we're not able to ask today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Muma and Dr. Lefevre for joining us. Um, we'll give you a second to give a little bit of welcomes, and then we know you have some updates that you'd like to share uh, before we go into the questions for this afternoon. Oh, President Muma, I think you're muted. That happens periodically. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, uh, Shirley and I are, uh, are very fortunate to be able to have these opportunities with you all. Um, we're looking forward to answering your questions. Uh, again, I want to thank you for everything you do for the university. Uh, I believe that uh, we have a great team and looking forward to the future. So turn it over to Shirley. Hi, everyone. And I will also say thank you for taking the time to be here. We appreciate the opportunity to hear what your questions are and give you an update and uh, just engage in this dialogue. So thank you. Wonderful. Well, let's get started with some um, KBOR updates. So since our last university town hall back in the fall, um, could you give us an update on any KBOR decisions that would affect our university community? I'd be happy to, um, and if they, Caleb, can you put the first slide up for me, please? Um, one of the things that, and I talked to you about this last time, is KBOR's Facilities Capital Renewal Initiative, which uh, the board passed new policy this past year um, to deal with the deferred maintenance. There's about $1.2 billion worth of deferred maintenance in the state. We have about $150 million in I think most of you are aware where most of those issues are um, and, we're, and we're working, I have been working very hard on making improvements on the, uh, the, the west side of campus um, and we'll continue to do that. The board's uh, new policy is um, uh, helping to accelerate uh, the, the pace of those uh, particular um, uh, issues around deferred maintenance. And one way they are trying to accelerate that is to assess each institution a maintenance assessment fee. And so what that means is that the universities will have to allocate some of their state general fund dollars toward this, towards this. And you see that on the first bullet point there, the annual maintenance assessment, um, which is basically equal to 2% of the current replacement value um, which means about $15.3 million for, for the university. Uh, we will be given some credit for current university facilities, uh, you know, building maintenance that we're already providing, um, some of our employees that, that help in, along um, our deferred maintenance, you know, carpenters, electricians, and those kinds of employees. And also, uh, when we uh, take on additional debt uh, and bonding, of, of, of facilities and we'll be able to count some of that toward um, this maintenance assessment fee. But for us, it's about $15 million. We have uh, six years to phase into that. And this next year, uh, we will uh, need to allocate about a half a million dollars towards this. And you can see every year um, that grows and this is cumulative. Uh, so if you were to add up all the numbers here, you can see by fiscal year 20. 28, we will be expected to be putting on an annual basis starting that year and going forward in around $11 million. And minus the, the credit that we'll be getting, given, 
all total, that'll be $15.3 million. So that's, that's significant. It's significant because we're going to have to reallocate along the way. Um, it's um, also in, a, in some ways a positive mood because we will have um, more opportunities to fix some of our um, deferred maintenance kinds of issues uh, uh, sooner rather than later and actually in bigger chunks as well. So that's one of the main um, initiatives that, that has a lot of consequence for our campus. Caleb, if you go to the next slide, uh, last um, or this month, just last week, the board approved expansion of our uh, tuition uh, programs, the Shocker City and Shocker Select discount programs, where we're providing in-state tuition in the metropolitan areas that you see listed there. As you may remember, about four or five years ago, we were getting approval in Kansas City, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, um, Dallas, Fort Worth to offer in-state tuition in those metropolitan areas. That's been very successful for us. We expanded it a couple of years ago to the St. Louis metro areas in Denver. Uh, and this past week, the Board of Regents gave us approval to expand it further in Colorado um, and Illinois, and also adding Iowa, Nebraska, and Arkansas, as you can see on this chart. This is giving us the opportunity to grow our first time in college student population and we are seeing dramatic increases in that population the idea is to bring new people to wichita state to our community get them connected to applied learning experiences so they'll stay here and work and help support our community going forward um, so i i, I Again, this is a very positive move on Wichita State's part. The Board of Regents uh, supports it 100%. And if you were listening to a board meeting last week, you'll, you would have heard uh, very positive comments about our strategy, not only around this particular initiative, but our overall strategy in terms of strategic enrollment management. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Mura. Uh, quick question on that graph, on that image. Uh, Caleb, can you put the um, the most recent uh, slide back up that you just showed? Um, for folks who don't know, can you talk about the difference between the Shocker City and Shocker Select? Yeah. So uh, Shocker City, uh, the, uh, the counties in the metro areas shaded in black. Um, individuals pay in-state tuition and in the county shaded in green in those states, uh, students pay 150% of in-state tuition. So it does uh, help if you live in the metropolitan areas, but there still is a discount in areas outside of that. Our approach has always been to go where most of our students are applying for, uh, from, and um, that's where we're seeing most of our application growth. And so that's the, the, the reason why we've asked for that in-state tuition discount um, in the black shaded uh, counties. Awesome. And this goes into effect immediately for students who are still applying for this fall semester. That's correct as well? Yeah, correct. Awesome. And the reason why we asked the board to approve that uh, discount uh, in March is because we've had uh, increase in applications from those areas that we've recently got approval uh, to expand in, and we feel like we have an opportunity to yield some of those students to enroll yet this fall. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, for Dr. Lefevre, this, this question is for you. Um, I know there was lots of conversations uh, in Cable recently about um, program review, so can you talk a little bit about the work that is currently being done um, and being discussed around uh, Cable's program review? And there's a follow-up to that, so I'll, I'll give you a second to kind of share and then I'll, I'll give you a follow-up. Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, and that's slide three. Caleb, if you... So uh, very recently, the Board of Regents hired some consultants that will work with all six of the Regents institutions to take a look at the, uh, the uh, portfolio of programs that are offered at each of the six institutions. Their primary goal is to look at ways that we might increase efficiency and effectiveness at each of the institutions. And uh, so more specifically, what they will be looking at is 
um, from the programs that are offered, how, how are they aligned with student interests? And uh, they will be looking for are the areas of duplication across the institutions and uh, we'll be making recommendations regarding how we might optimize that, those, that portfolio of programs. Um, also look at the match to current workforce needs and then our current utilization of resources and what opportunities there might be to increase the efficiency across this, the institutions. Uh, the steering committee was just recently formed. The first meeting is scheduled to um, be the first week of April. The, each of the Regents institutions has three representatives. Uh, for WSU, and so the provost from every institution is one of those representatives. And then they asked for a person who is familiar with uh, faculty, a broad spectrum of faculty and how um, faculty uh, workloads are impacted by the programs that are offered and could provide sort of that perspective as well as a familiarity with the program review process that we currently have in place. So um, we anticipate that they will bring forward their recommendations this fall. I'm sure what's uppermost in most of your minds right now is, is what about our current program review process? Because I know that we have some programs that have just started um, that. So we our plan is to continue forward with the program review process that we have in place. In the fall, it may be that we will have to tweak that um, somewhat, but um, all we can do is play that part by ear. So. Perfect, you beat me to the second question, so I appreciate that. The other um, initiative that can, the Kansas Board of Regents has um, started on is, uh, it, this is part of the deferred ma maintenance. And so every institution is, is being asked to look at how we can increase our efficiency in our classroom and space utilization. So if you wanna go to the next slide there, um, what they've asked us to do, it's, so they, they hired again some consultants that would look at each region institution and they used a formula to determine what percentage of usage we currently have and have asked us to reach a, a, uh, a benchmark. They haven't given us the benchmark yet, uh, but, but Hypothetically, if we were at 56%, they might come back and tell us that we would need to reach 75% uh, efficiency. So not knowing what those uh, benchmarks will be yet, what we, what we wanted to do is kind of get out in front of that. We have some software that allows us to optimize our classroom utilization. So um, we formed a task force. We had representation from all of the colleges on, on that group. And we identified what factors should be considered when thinking about how we assign classrooms. And so you'll see those uh, uh, priorities listed. First of all is enrollment. We want to make sure that um, large classes are prioritized for the larger classroom spaces and, and so on. Uh, you can see uh, this is the order of the prior priorities as well. So if an instructor has back-to-back -back classes, the preference will be to put that instructor in classes that are in the same building, for example. So um, that work, the task force came back with these recommendations and we have asked schedule, schedule builders to um, take those, to go ahead and plan their um, schedules uh, for the for the fall, and then we'll we'll turn on the optimization tool, and it will show the schedule builders, you know, what the proposed schedule will look, look like compared to uh, previous iterations of the schedule. So we're kind of doing a phase-in approach with the hope of being fully operational by next spring, spring 23. And then the last initiative that KBOR has implemented is um, a study of all of the student health centers at each of the region's institutions. And again, that uh, study is just getting underway. And uh, the chair of that committee is actually, uh, rep 
is on WSU's uh, National Advisory Committee. So uh, it's nice to have somebody who's familiar with WSU on that task force. Thank you for sharing those updates. Uh, before we move on to the, the next segment of our town hall, any additional uh, information relating to KBOR that um, either of you want to share? I'll just say the, the chair of that Student Health Center um, committee or task force for the board is Dr. Debbie Haynes. She's a, a graduate of Wichita State, as Shirley said, on the National Advisory Council and a retired county practitioner um, from Wichita. So she's real familiar with Wichita State, understands uh, our initiatives around student health and wellness that we've done over the last couple of years. So uh, uh, I think that it's a plus that we have someone like that um, uh, heading that task force. And when will that, um, I don't know, I asked you at, a, at our KBOR meeting um, afterwards, but when will the results of that task force um, when will their work be completed? My understanding is in June. June, yeah. okay. Yeah. Awesome. All right, well, thank you both. Um, we're gonna shift gears and move over to um, everyone's favorite topic. I know it's mine right now because I am probably nerding out watching everything that the state legislator is doing. Uh, and I know that that warms Zach's heart. Um, so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about budget forecasts and preparation. Um, Zach Gearhart, who is the chief of staff, is here joining us. Uh, he's going to give an, an update um, relating to the budget forecast for uh, fiscal year 23 um, a little bit later in the town hall. But um, to kind of uh, get things started, Zach, can you kind of talk a little bit about um, WSU's priorities for funding um, in the upcoming fiscal year? Yeah, we have, you know, you're going to talk about that, Zach, or do you want me to talk about that? I'll let you uh, cover that first. If you want. Yeah. So uh, let's go to slide. Uh, that next slide, Caleb. Yeah, so um, in terms of our priorities, and of course, Zach will talk about where we are and um, uh, basically, um, you know, where we are now and try to uh, predict where we might be at the end of this uh, fiscal year, which is kind of risky to do, um, but we are in a better place than we've been before. Um, but these are the things that uh, we will be prioritizing. And this has come about from conversations with many of you all, the uh, President's Budget Advisory Committee, um, you know, information that Shirley is gathering through academic affairs and, um, and the areas that she has responsibility uh, from uh, Warner Going and administrative, Administration and Finance and, and those are the main areas of the campus, and we have a lot of other areas that fall up under the president. All of these individuals have been providing input, and we're settling on um, basically these three things. Compensation, of course, we've been making that clear, um, that we are trying to, uh, to prioritize uh, uh, salary for our employees. It's one of my main priorities uh, uh, in terms of internal kinds of activities to focus on. We have been for a number of years investing in need-based aid, and we'll continue to do that. That's the reason why we're growing as an institution. And then we have mandatory expenses, and these are just an example of some of those. Uh, of course, uh, we continue to fund promotions and academic rank and tenure. Uh, I mentioned the capital renewal initiative, uh, the employee fringe benefit costs that uh, continue to increase every year, utility expenses, and then insurance. Uh, we've had some increases recently in cyber security insurance. Uh, so these are the main things that we'll be prioritizing. Uh, the Budget uh, Advisory Committee um, has a process that they look at other uh, requests, and um, those will be uh, evaluated if funding is available. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at, uh, Gabriel, in terms of our priorities. Wonderful. Thanks, President Muma. Um, we know that the pay analysis is currently being conducted and is on track to be finished, I think, by the end of April. When the completed data is available to you, what are your next steps in addressing pay inequities across campus for faculty and staff? So, uh, Whitney, you're, you're correct, and we do have a slide for that as well, like slide five. 
um, that that work is currently underway. Um, the pay analysis is is almost complete. What HR right now is looking at data that has identified if there are any gaps in the pay, uh, comparing uh, what the external market has told us about what an uh, pay might be for a particular position and and what our internal pay is. And so we're looking to see if there's disparities, disparities between the external market and the internal uh, pay. And then also if there's any um, inequities in terms of within a, a job category, um, if there's a unexpected pay range for inexplicable reasons. So for example, um, I, I mean, is anyone gross, maybe I shouldn't use the word gross, but um, inordinately overpaid or inordinately underpaid? And if they find some of those, they have found a, a handful of those individuals. And so now they are going and talking with supervisors of those individuals to see if there's explanation for it. Sometimes it's a person ha who has been promoted or provided or been asked to do additional uh, duties. There's a variety of reasons that might exist. And so um, once they get that information, um, they are looking then if there are any of those that need to be rectified. Um, so once that information gathering is complete, we will determine what dollar amount that will cost to uh, fix any of those issues. And then um, we will be at a place where we can uh, start to identify what dollar amount it will cost us to um, raise everyone's salaries across campus. And of course, we'll have to make some decisions about it, will it be across the board increase for um, everyone? Will will some will we adjust it based on um, you try to get some individuals up to a certain level? Those will all be conversations that we'll we'll need to have, and uh, of course that it will be dependent upon what is the budget that will be available, and we won't know that until the state legislature has um, has finalized those budgets. So once all of that's that's finished, we will, human resources will communicate what those pay ranges will be, and um, then employees will be notified. We'll be glad to answer any questions. As we probably wait for questions to come in, I, I do have one that I, um, that I just wanna make sure that I understood correctly that I, uh, Winnie and I have been in lots of meetings about um, the pay analysis with HR. This is an, an annual thing that we'll do um, to ensure that we're keeping up with um, with pay. And, and I know that, right, this isn't necessarily the most fun work that um, campus is, is enjoying right now, but this is an annual thing that we'll do to to ensure that we're, we're keeping up with even what it's going to probably look like down the road, correct? Thank you for asking that, uh, Gabriel. Yes, and and remember that we also have the each job is associated with the pay range on our website, so it'll be a constant monitoring. And then in eighteen months, we'll do another kind of deep dive, take a look at the data again, and then we'll do it again in thirty six months. So, it, our plan is to continue to monitor and and adjust as we go. Awesome, thank you. And I did want to put out there for for um, faculty and staff that are um, what are listening. Uh, staff Senate just got its briefing from HR this past Tuesday during its staff meeting, um, and I know uh, faculty Senate will get theirs just coming up Monday. Yes, yeah, Monday is when the faculty Senate meets. Uh, so if you do have any additional questions or any thoughts, please feel free to reach out to your senators. Uh, reach out to Whitney and myself. Uh, we continue to engage with HR in meetings um, as we have our monthly meetings with them. Uh, and this always is a, is a, a subject that we um, get updates from. So um, continue to remain connected uh, with us. We did have a couple of questions come in. Um, so we'll go ahead and ask the first one from Heather. Um, how will pay analysis and compensation adjustment uh, be the same? Sorry. How will pay analysis and compensation adjustments be the same or different for soft money centers? They would uh, 
be the same if there is an adjustment that needs to be made then the centers um, would be expected to make those adjustments using their uh, sources of revenue awesome and then i had a question come in through teams because i guess they didn't put it on the youtube but um so to your piece with with pay analysis and the work that's going there um does this mean that if someone is underpaid uh, according to market um that they're going to be that departments will be required to get them to market value um or is that going to adjust um based off of whatever the plan is to to execute um possible salary increases Shirley, do you want to answer that? Uh, I'm trying to make sure I'm understanding your question, but the expectation is that everyone's salaries will be raised to the level that we determine. Um, we know that not every unit has the same resources available, so that's the other thing that we're doing at the, at the university level is trying to collect or determine what dollar amount we will have available to be able to allocate to this did that answer the question i'm going to assume yes um because it made sense to me so i will i assume yes so i, I guess i'll just add to let's say it's going to cost a million dollars to do this i'm just throwing that out i don't know if it's going to cost a million i don't know if it's going to cost two three million uh, whatever the amount is we have to determine whether we're going to be able to cover that in, through internal allocations or reallocations or through new money that, that we may get from the state. It may be a situation that we will not be able to take care of it in one year. So there's some discussion happening in the chat and um, Rick or Shirley, either one of you can kind of weigh in. Um, we're talking about pay analysis for full-time faculty and staff at the moment, but student workers and graduate assistants, their pay scale has been a topic of discussion um, in the graduate school. Um, so you might want to give a, a very quick update that that is being looked at, and that is, that's not part of this pay analysis, um, but it is on the docket. Yes. Correct. And I can I can share with you that our VP of research, Colleen Pugh, is is very much on top of this. She will she has been meeting with colleges uh, to talk about a planned approach for how to address that. But it's a high priority, and um, every intention will be made to address that. We had another question in the chat, and I'm going to attempt to ask it. Um, I don't know if I don't get your question across, Laura, please feel free to uh, re rephrase your question. But Laura's question is, uh, so a cost of living increase on a regular basis would be above and beyond what needs to be adjusted for position. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, I'm going to put that up there and see if there's a possible response. Well, I would just say that, that Yes, that is a possibility. We, as Shirley mentioned in a previous slide, we will have to make a decision whether we will do market-based alone or in addition to uh, that uh, cost of living um, or some sort of mix. Um, that's to be determined and that'll be discussed further in the President's Budget Advisory Council. But it is possible that some people will be brought up to market and also receive a cost of living increase but again that hasn't been decided but that, that is in the realm of possibilities there is a question in the chat from marcia that says has higher uh, administration considered delaying their pay increases to retain staff and get people in those pay gaps to the rates they're overdue for so you're talking about, I'm assuming you're talking about has uh, executive leadership at the university, the deans had a conversation about delaying any pay increases for themselves to use those dollars that, yeah. So we haven't had that conversation last year. Many of you know that the executive team um, did not uh, partake in any bonuses that were sent uh, across campus to employees, um, but we haven't had any conversations uh, about that for this year. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. So I think those are the last questions around um, around budget. But as Whitney and I have done for the past now two town halls, we're going to take a pause right here to do some special recognition of some folks on campus um, that uh, we want to give some some special shout out to. So I'm going to kick it off, and then I'm going to turn it over to Whitney to do hers. Um, and my, my first one, and I think as, as Whitney and I were talking about uh, who to recognize this time, um, we, we want, want to take a second to recognize our friends in human resources. Uh, we know that they have had um, some unpopular work uh, going on in, in their department with everything with market-based, with pay analysis, but important work that I think um, is, is significant to the work that, we're, that we need to do as an institution. Um, as it exists within our DEI plan, as it exists within our strategic plan. Um, so I want to I want to take a moment to thank um, the HR staff for all the work that you all have um, have done this semester uh, during the pandemic with helping provide policy and guidance uh, to departments as they worked on ways of maneuvering um, through um, the the unexpected with that with all the work with onboarding employees. Um, with market-based compensation, the pay analysis, everything. Um, and then on top of that, keeping Whitney and I up to date with everything, even the smallest little reminders or updates, um, and just keeping us informed with what's going on. Um, and we just want to uh, uh, express our complete appreciation to you all um, and for the work that you're doing um, and uh, the work that you will continue to do because it's important work uh, and we thank you guys for that. So round of applause for that. And our second special shout out is to international education with an influx of international students coming in uh, this spring semester. International Ed has been um, very busy welcoming our international students to Wichita and to WSU. We know that due to COVID, um, there was uh, a gap sometimes for some of our international students um, to get to campus um, from their home country. So. Um, international education, thank you, thank your entire team um, for your hard work in supporting our international students um, and easing their transition to campus. So thank you very much. We're going to shift gears just a little bit and talk about the current legislative session. Um, and so we have some questions that um, I think we're going to ask President Muma, but we also have some questions for Zach Gearhart, our chief of staff. So, um, Rick, I believe that you've had the opportunity to meet with several legislative committees this session. Could you provide us with an update on those interactions? Yeah, I'd be happy, be happy to. Um, so every spring, uh, beginning of the legis legislative session, all the presidents of the universities have the opportunity to talk to the Senate and House subcommittees on education, uh, the Appropriations Committee. Uh, I have met with the governor uh, on a number of occasions, um, but right at the beginning of the legislative session, uh, uh, regularly have been meeting with the Senate president. We are in regular contact with all the other leaders and the Speaker of the House and other senior leaders. Uh, we just uh, attended a reception up in Topeka this past week during the board meeting uh, for legislators where we have an opportunity in a more casual uh, uh, environment to talk to them about the priorities of the institution. All of these meetings uh, is what I do is talk about Wichita State, our story, what we're trying to do here, uh, and and focusing in on the priorities, uh, as, as I've mentioned many times, uh, affordability and access, increasing enrollment, making sure that we pay attention to the, the, the needs of uh, our employers, whoever hires our graduates, making sure that we're providing a talent pipeline to them and then making sure that we're engaging in increasing economic prosperity for the people that live in this area and the state. And we do this through research, through creative activities and other service initiatives. These are all the things that I'm talking about with them. Our story resonates really well um, with the legislature because we're growing, we're connecting with our community. Uh, we we're, we're, have a lot of success uh, that, uh, that you know, other institutions are struggling with in our state. Uh, so um, uh, it's always better to be able to tell a legislator that we're growing, particularly when you're asking for money. So if you're not growing, why would they give you any more money? 
Uh, so uh, I think all those conversations have been very positive um, and have had multiple conversations uh, with those leaders, but and also local leaders, uh, the city leaders, county leaders, Greater Wichita Partnership. These people also are advocating not only for their needs, but also uh, uh, for our needs as well. Awesome. Thank you. And Zach, this is now your time to shine. I'm excited to hear uh, your legislative update. So I will turn it over to, to Zach, who is probably spending a lot of time in Topeka paying attention to what's going on up in the state legislature. So uh, this is going to be our legislative update. All right. Thanks, Gabriel. And first of all, let me just say I'm excited to hear that uh, my legislative updates do warm some people's hearts. I don't think you can say that, and I appreciate you uh, letting me know that. Um, Caleb, would you go ahead and throw up the uh, legislative update slides, please? Thank you. Um, so just some context for where we're at. I believe the last time I spoke with all of you, we knew what KBOR's legislative requests were going to be. Um, and since then, we've had an opportunity to view the governor's budget, and now we're kind of getting a look at what the House and the Senate want to do. When KBOR developed its legislative uh, request for this year, they really did try to focus on their pillars, access and affordability, building a talent pipeline for the future, and then economic prosperity for our communities in Kansas. So right now, where we're at with session, if I had to put a percentage or a fraction on it, I'd say we're about two thirds the way finished. Um, the House and the Senate have both passed their budget bills. Um, you know, don't want to get too much into the weeds here, but the way this works is obviously the House has their version of what they want to do. The Senate has their version of what they want to do. So their leadership's going to come together next week, work out some differences, and then send a budget bill to the governor. And then they're going to go on recess, give the governor time to review that budget bill, and then they'll come back towards the uh, end of March, um, early April, um, or end of April, first week of May, I should say. So just to run through some of the high points for higher education, the way I kind of think about the budget is in different pools. Um, the first one is general operating. KBOR had requested $45 million for operations for higher education for universities, um, really to focus on inflationary increases, keeping tuition flat, as well as restoration for previous cuts. Um, the Senate really honed in on keeping tuition flat um, as part of that $45 million request. So what they said was, we'll allocate 20 million now and we'll come back during Omnibus, which again, last week of April, and decide if we wanna do the other 25 million. Um, the House really uh, went ahead and approved the full 45. So next week, like I said, they'll work through conference and see uh, if they want to go towards the House position, the Senate position, or something in between. As you can imagine, it's negotiation, so they'll likely end up somewhere in the middle. Employee pay, I know as we uh, talked about earlier, it's an important issue for all the region's institutions, including Wichita State. The governor included uh, a in state employee pay increase of about 5% for state employees. Um, that equates to about a $24 million pool for higher education, but it's important to realize that 5% is only for the S SGF portion of, of our budget, the state general fund. So we've got obviously a lot of different um, pockets of money that kind of make up our, our budget. So it wouldn't be equate to a full 5% for every employee, that $24 million, but it does help us address some of our needs here on campus if that does go through. And both the Senate and the House have that in their budgets currently. So very optimistic on employee pay. Um, Need-based aid, you've heard the president talk about this quite a bit. It's been a priority of his at KBOR. Um, the governor recommended a $25 million need-based aid program. The House moved that to something that's already in existence called the Comprehensive Grant. Um, that's something that both private universities as well as public universities plan. Um, the Senate moved 19 million of it into the comprehensive grant. So there's gonna be again, some negotiated, negotiation and conference about what that ends up being. We're gonna continue as a university to push the message that we should invest in need-based aid. We should do it um, on a Pell eligibility need uh, basis. 
and we continue to be behind a lot of our fellow peers in our region. So it's going to continue to be a priority and a talking point for us going forth in this session. Um, economic development, you know, Rick did a nice job talking about how the legislature has received a lot of our requests very positively. And if you look at what the governor did in her budget, she put in $195 million for the Kansas Department of Commerce um, to create a grant program for universities to partner with business to grow jobs and grow economic prosperity. Um, unfortunately, for a lot of different reasons, we don't have to get into the weeds a bit, but um, that's getting parsed out into different segments. So part of that money, there was $35 million for WSU for NIAR Works. That's that maintenance repair overhaul project that we're doing modifying triple sevens. Um, the House approved uh, all of that $35 million uh, up front in the coming FY23 year. Um, the House moved $39 million to the community colleges for economic development projects with a, with a matching component. And the remaining $121 million for the other universities was deleted and to be reviewed at Omnibus in, in April. Um, I think, you know, just to be candid, I, where our university really shines is we have plenty of examples and opportunities to partner with business, to grow workforce, to grow wealth and prosperity in our region. I think that's why uh, we're one of the universities that's actually funded and don't have to wait for Omnibus. So that's a real positive uh, for us going forth. Um, in the Senate, they are giving us $7 million a year over five years for a total of $35 million. Um, and they're slightly modifying the wording to be a little bit more loose, focusing on digital transformation and the MRO, which you uh, obviously have likely heard myself or the president or others at the university talk about the importance of digital transformation as it impacts all of our industries in Kansas. Um, the remaining $160 million of that on the Senate side is to be reviewed at Omnibus. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, need-based aid in the Senate, um, went over this already, um, economic development. Yeah, we've covered all of this. Sorry, my apologies. But I'll go ahead and stop there. Um, but there are some policy bills that, as I always try to keep you updated on uh, going forth throughout session. So um, one thing the Senate's been focusing on is fairness of women's sports. This, you're going to read about this in the paper. Just wanted you to be aware. We do know about it. This focuses on uh, biological males competing in female sports and vice versa. And this really kind of says uh, we're going to have single categories for each. It's going to, it's a very contentious issue nationally, locally, um, we hear about it. Uh, it's passed out of the Senate. It still has to be reviewed by the by the House and the governor. Um, Parents' Bill of Rights, this is kind of focused on CRT, uh, passed uh, out of the Senate, but it doesn't really impact us so far. It focuses on K-12. So that's really, I'm just going to stop there on, on policy bills and uh, stand for any questions that there might be. As we wait for possible questions to come in, um, for folks that don't know, can you explain what the omnibus process is? Um, I know there were a couple of pieces in there that show that talked about waiting to omnibus. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? Sure. Uh, what that means is every year the governor provides a budget recommendation, the House and Senate modify it and send it back to the governor for approval or veto. Um, but what happens is, is they take the month of April mostly off while they're waiting for economic data about what the next, what the current year tax receipts will do as well as next year's receipts to get an idea of really what the revenue is going to be, how they build the budget up on their revenue. Um, and so by waiting a month, they get a clearer idea of what that is. So Omnibus is a way, it's a vehicle, a bill to add money to the budget if there's a surplus to take money away if there is a recession or a dip in revenue. Um, also, it allows to clean up any errors that were made in any of the policy bills. So it's kind of the last train that leaves the station. So when I say that something's waiting to be reviewed at Omnibus, it'll be the last thing they do for, for session before uh, choosing whether or not to allocate those funds. Thank you. This question is probably more for Rick or Shirley. Um, we're all hopeful that the 45 million will come through on the governor's budget for higher education. But if it isn't approved or if 
only a fraction of it is approved to come to higher education. How long are higher ed institutions going to be required to maintain a flat tuition rate? Uh, that's a great question. And um, so the, the deal that was made with the Board of Regents and the governor legislature, if, if the state plus up our budgets by about $46 million, we wouldn't have to increase tuition. If it comes in below any uh, uh, amount less than that, um, or to be determined what that is, then tuition increases is back on the table. Um, uh, but again, we won't be able to, to determine that until we know, as Zach just pointed out, what happens at Omnibus. Uh, so, uh, I hope that answers the question, but th th at this point, um, the, in order to keep tuition flat, uh, we really need that full amount or close to that full amount funded. Awesome. Thank you. Before we wrap up, um, I had a question for Dr. Lefebvre that I wanted um, to ask. Um, I know that at our last town hall, you mentioned um, some of the work that you're doing with the Equity Task Force with Dr. Barry and Bobby Gandu. Um, can you share an update about um, the progress of that group? I would be glad to do that. So we met yesterday to in the uh, small, we have four small groups looking at recommendations in uh, four areas, institutional policies, institutional practices, routines, and uh, oh gosh, Campus culture. I think. Campus culture. Thank you. And uh, so those four groups came up with their lists of recommendations. And the next step, we have one more meeting, which will be in April. And those recommendations will, will be compiled and prioritized. And then we will be working with uh, Dr. Fleming Randall to incorporate those into the, the larger DEI plan for the, for the campus. Great question, thank you. Thank you. So we don't have any additional questions or comments in the chat at the moment, um, but those viewers, if you have questions or comments, please continue to ask those in the chat. And um, we did want to remind faculty and staff, um, May Friday, May 6th is the President's Distinguished Service Award Ceremony. Um, that will be in the Marcus Welcome Center from 9 to 1030 in the morning. Um, and we'll also be hosting the University Faculty Awards um, that afternoon, Friday, May 6th from 2 to 330 also in the Marcus Welcome Center. And then we do want to just share with you all um, that uh, our next town hall uh, that Whitney and I, and probably our last one that we'll be uh, moderating together um, is set uh, for May uh, as well. So more information will come out about that one uh, shortly, but that will be the last time you get to see our pretty faces on the screen uh, through these town halls. Uh, so we'll we'll wait a second to see if any other additional questions come in uh, and then we'll we'll close out. Uh, Whitney or Gabriel, do you, do you want us to address Laura Young's oh. question that came in at 331? Yes, we'll go ahead and put that one up. So um, the question was, looks like we may be past this, which is, oh, okay. Uh, after the first round of pay adjustments, is there a plan for working in years, working in years of experience at the university for increases? Well, I'll just say two things about that and Shirley can uh, chime in if there's some additional information that she thinks that needs to be added. That's what the pay analysis, of part of the pay analysis is to take into consideration um, individuals' uh, experience. Uh, I think what you're probably asking about, uh, which used to be um, uh, in uh, uh, the civil service uh, uh, policies and some longe longevity pay, um, that's not something that we um, are considering at this point in terms of the uh, compensation evaluation that we're doing. Awesome. Thank you for, for catching that one. Um, okay. 
Well, I'm also would be remiss to say this, but I think that Winnie would agree. Um, I don't actually, maybe she will, can chime in about this one relating to elections for faculty senate, but I'm just going to talk about South Senate election. Uh, ours are coming up in, a, in, in April, and so information will be coming out shortly uh, to all staff on campus to nominate folks to um, serve on the staff senate for the upcoming year. Um, so take a look out for that. Um, and then for staff as well, specifically for staff, um, we are working with our partners at the other KBOR institutions to put out um, a staff satisfaction survey. So that information will be sent to your email as well in April. Um, so more information will be um, coming out for both of those things. And Winnie, I don't know if you want to mention anything about elections for faculty staff. Yes. So my vice president, uh, JoLynn Dowling out of College of Health Professions. She is hard at work at the moment of getting nominations and ballots out for um, university at large uh, faculty senator representations. And then once those uh, individuals are voted on and elected, um, she will start to collect nominations for college specific representation for faculty senators. So um, my VP is hard at work. Uh, faculty, I encourage you to serve. It's a great opportunity to serve um, and have uh, transparency and shared governance and your voice and feedback um, on campus. Uh, there is a question in the chat from Heather Perkins um, about the uh, current analysis. She said, so years of experience is part of the current analysis being done. Yes, experience is a part of, of uh, the, the pay analysis. And then we have another question from Kim Sandlin. Um, any update on the Provo search? That's a great question, Kim. Uh, so yeah, we are in the final stage of the Provo search. Um, and actually, probably what I should do is turn it over back over to Whitney Bailey, who's the co-chair of the search committee, along with Warner Going, and let her talk about where we are because she's got more of the details of kind of nuts and bolts. Thanks, President Mima. So the search committee has um, done um, interviews through Zoom uh, with the candidates. Um, and we selected um, three candidates to come on campus. We're actually going to hold those interviews the week of April the 4th. Um, Werner Golling and I were co-chairing, and so we were in his office just uh, two days ago working on a schedule for all of those. So um, once we're able to get the rooms and facilities um, outlined, we're going to have each candidate meet with different constituency groups, deans, directors, faculty senate, staff senators, um, SGA as well. Um, I think there's approximately 10 different groups that the, uh, each candidate will meet with um, on their time on campus. Um, and those will all, the schedule will be coming out, but those will all be from April the 4th to April the 8th. Yeah, and my understanding, uh, Whitney, from talking to Werner, uh, this morning that I believe next week there's going to be sort of a high level overview of uh, the schedule uh, and when the candidates will be um, announced, which will be shortly before uh, they actually arrive on campus. Yes, that is correct. We're, we're getting some high level information, CVs and things uh, to provide to the university campus so that those can be reviewed um, while the candidates are on campus um, to get to know them. Awesome. Okay, well, that is all we have time for today. Thank you, uh, everyone, for tuning in and watching uh, and engaging with us during the town hall. Uh, thank you, President Muma and Dr. Lefebvre and Zach for um, taking time out of your afternoons um, and providing the community with an update. Uh, and behind the scenes, Caleb, thank you for your help uh, with orchestrating um, all of this work as well. Um, we did have a final question come in and maybe it's, it's kind of significant, so I think I'm gonna ask it really fast uh, and then I promise we'll wrap up there. So um, with the news of, of Dr. K. Monk Morgan uh, leaving at the end of the semester, um, are there any plans about um, the division um, and what, what's to come next from that? Shirley, do you wanna answer that question? 
Sure. So we are, um, I have spent the last week or so going around and meeting with all of her direct reports. And uh, so we will be doing some temporary um, asking people to fill in temporarily until uh, the new provost is named and then we'll make some permanent uh, decisions on leadership in those in that area at that point. Awesome. Thank you. All right. That is the final question. Thank you guys again for joining us uh, and to our friends watching us uh, watching. Thank you for taking time. You all have a wonderful rest of your afternoon uh, and we'll see you around.